I will be continuing on this topic for a little while. I'm a bit of a Bible translation nerd. And uh, I think the whole topic needs a little bit of fair and balanced information. And I hope I can contribute that to everyone who uh, is interested in that topic. Well, good morning. I hope that you are doing well today. Here, I believe January 10th of 2024. I have been wanting to do this video for quite a long time. And quite honestly, I just haven't felt prepared enough to do it. Um, I have not felt adequate quite yet to do it. If it, you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that one of the first videos that I did uh, when I started this channel in August of 2022 was a Bible translation that we recommend here at Blue Collar Bible Man. Well, some time has gone by. Uh, if you know, about a year ago, I got into the King James Only movement just a little bit. Um, wasn't for long, but I did say the King James was the only Bible you should read. Uh, that is wrong. Um, for any of you who would have seen me say that and have not heard me update that since, I apologize. Um, there are a lot of vast issues with the King James Only movement, and I am not King James Only. And so um, I, I was for a little bit, um, but once I looked at more information, uh, discovered that things were not quite as accurate as a lot of the information is out there. So that's then once I realized that that was wrong, I was like, okay, well, back to square one, best Bible. Um, because let, I will be real with you, King James onlyists are not completely wrong. Um, they're wrong in the textual basis for new Bibles about how that they're less adequate. They come from heretical sources. Um, sure, there's been less than um, adequate or desirable people involved in the translation process along the way, as well as finding the right manuscripts. Um, but, but that is with anything. I guarantee you throughout the Bible, there were people that translated um, pieces of scrolls and they were not real righteous scribes. I, 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 you know, let's just be real here. Um, I mean, you know, you have to remember that there was a Judas in the 12 disciples. And so just because there is a bad person involved in Bible translation at some point, that does not make, you know, everything following that uh, bad, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, they're, King James only is still wrong when it comes to heretical origins of the manuscripts that are behind these Bibles here. Um, however, they are not wrong on everything. Um, I actually have come to believe that they are extremely, not perfectly, but pretty much on point with you know, of using one Bible, number one. Number two, having a Bible that's extremely memorable. We're going to mention that as well. Um, so they're, they're not wrong on every single thing. Um, is there a plot to uh, corrupt Bible translations? Well, spiritually, yes. Um, you, you can't have an adequate knowledge, I mean, even just a basic knowledge of Bible, uh, just reading different passages, and you can see that Satan has, has always tried to uh, get in there and mess up God's plan. I mean, it, it, everyone, you can't be a Bible-believing Christian and not say that. <clears throat> so everyone knows that. We got that established, right? Is there a literal, physical plan to mess up the Bible? I don't know. Um, I don't think to end all Bibles. No, I actually don't think that. Um, because one of the organizations on the earth that 
at one time burned many, many Bibles, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Now they've got quite a few translations of their own, not as many as Protestant evangelical uh, translations, but they do have a few translations. And so I, I, I don't think anyone is trying to get rid of all Bibles. However, King James only is, do have a point when they talk about things being changed. Um, and actually quite a few knowledgeable, credible sources on Bible translation um, where the methods of translation, they would actually, some of them would say sort of the same thing, okay? Because remember, if you are not keeping it in translation, the way that God divine look, look we got to establish this. God divinely inspired the authors of Scripture, Old and New Testament. You say, well, the New Testament's not technically Scripture. Look, if if Jesus's words are not Scripture to you, then uh, me personally, I think you have a problem. <clears throat> but anyway. Um, as well as the apostles that were inspired by the same Holy Spirit as the Old Testament writers. So there you go. Um, but you you have to remember this. The, the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit as it was written. It is infallible. It is inerrant. Uh you know, so when a Bible is translated from the Hebrew, the Greek, and a little bit of Aramaic, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm wrong on that, please correct me. When it is translated from those original languages, the Holy Spirit inspired it to be written in a certain form. There are many different things that come into play there. There's repetitive pieces throughout. Um, Anyone who has, has, you know, if you're new to Bible translation, then maybe that's a little bit new to you. Um, but, but, but it is. It, there's a reason why the King James is sort of translated in that way. There's different repetitive rhythmic ways. The original text in the original languages is like that. So a Bible should... If you want to be technical about it, if you're going to put it in other languages the way that it was given in those original languages, then doesn't it make sense to have it follow a similar format? Now, um, so if, if you know anything about Bible translation, the literal approach technically would be the way for that, or the word for word approach. Um, I think that Bill Mounts has a point when he says that there's technically no literal translation. Mark Strauss also has a point. I want to be extremely fair in this video. I, I, I want this video to be the most fair, well-balanced, thought-out video on these topics. Um, I want to say right out, if you want a short video, this is not going to be a short video. Um, I probably will divide this up into segments, possibly. <clears throat> Um, but we're going to start from one end of the translation spectrum to the other. And we will go from there. Now, I do want to say the thumbnail for this video should have the pictures of everyone that I have learned what I know on this topic from. Whether they agree with me or I agree with them, I do agree with them, or I'm sort of in the middle. And there will even be King James onlyist people on the thumbnail of this video. Um, so, this is what I have learned over the course of literally three years now of looking at this topic off and on. I, am, I do not have a degree, but I've learned quite a bit. <clears throat> so. What is the best Bible? That's what we're going to get into today. Starting from one end of the spectrum to the other, we're going to start from the, if you look it up on Google, 
what you're going to see is over here, word for word, literal. What you're going to see here in the middle is like a dynamic equivalence. Then you'll see paraphrase. And there are translations all along that continuum. Starting from here over NLT. Uh, this Bible, I've, uh, I actually do enjoy reading this Bible. Um, I've preached out of this Bible. If you're new to this channel, we do have a church live stream every single week, 11 a.m. on Sundays, sometimes 11, 15 a.m. if I'm running a little bit behind, if I'm not done studying yet. Um, but that's how it goes. So NLT, that's going to be on the far end of the spectrum. Um, some people say that this is a dynamic equivalence translation. I, I literally, I have heard four different descriptions of the NLT within an hour um, between listening to different professionals, experts, ministers, scholars, whatever, describing the NLT. Okay. Um, it's, they want, a lot of people want to say this is a dynamic equivalent. Um, I think it's literally a, a blend of dynamic equivalent translation and paraphrase. I think that that is a very fair way to describe the NLT. Uh, you say, well, why, why would it be a paraphrase? Because <clears throat> isn't a paraphrase not really a translation? Yeah, exactly. Um, this is not word for word. This is on a fifth or sixth grade reading level, the, NL the NLT. Um, it is very easy to read. <clears throat> it's very helpful for children. However, I've heard people say that. And I've heard ministers say that on different podcasts and everything else. Um, there are some places, it depends on how young your children are and what you want them to know about certain things of life. When the scripture is describing Israel's um, sin, like in Ezekiel or some of the prophets, uh, when it talks about in Genesis, um, uh, different uh, sexual terms, if you will, that uses the term slept with, that Adam slept with his wife or whatever. And if you have very young children, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess people see things differently now. When I was growing up, you didn't use that term especially with young children. That was kind of taboo. I had a very traditional upbringing. But the NLT uses that wording. Um, I'm not very crazy about that. I don't think that terms like that, especially that are in the Bible, there's a reason why the King James said Adam knew his wife. Um, does it have to say that we knew because we all know that new does not mean what the King James translators meant there. Um, but I do think a translation should try to keep that, you know, that understanding, so to, so to speak, um, <laughs> of what's going on there. NIV. This is another translation I have found very helpful. Um, in some ways, this is still my favorite. I, I, will be, I will fully admit um, in some ways. Uh, when I started out three years ago, uh, when I, I would say that I'm three years old in the Lord, um, that I have a very long uh, story with God, the Bible, and church. But three years ago, I'm 35 now, and three years ago is when I would say that I was really, really, fully born again in the Spirit of God. And um, the NIV translation of the four Gospels had a large part in that. Um, I read the four Gospels in the NIV. I read a portion of them in the NRSV, um, King James a little bit. And then I went and looked at the ESV, which was a very good uh, rendering of the four Gospels. So, NIV, very good translation. If you look at, at the, if you Google a Bible translation chart, NIV should be in the very middle 
of the chart. This is dynamic equivalence. Dynamic equivalence is a thought for thought um, where, say, uh, King James or NASB, ESV, New King James are going to be word for word. Thought for thought means that translators will take a sentence, a verse, uh, maybe a couple verses that are in context, and, it, and they go for the thought of the meaning of the text. Now, not completely. There are places, I'll be, I'm, I'm trying to have this as fair as possible, okay? There are places where the NIV is almost the same word for word as the ESV, okay? Um, the, the NIV still does go word for word in places. <clears throat> uh, they, they try to keep the approach of a lot of Bible translators. Um, I, I think Eugene Nida may have... This could have came from him, um, but they try to keep the approach of as literal as possible, as free as necessary, so that they maintain an, un an understandable translation throughout. Um, I, I know the NIV can be very controversial. Uh, there are some valid reasons why it's not my number one pick, hint, hint. I'll go ahead and say that now. Um, but... It does hold a special place with me, and I think it can still be useful, and we'll, we will talk about that. <clears throat> CSB. This would be next up because it's, it is, there is some dynamic equivalency in it. This is not necessarily a Southern Baptist <laughs> translation. Um, Lifeway, Holman, uh, they did put out, or they did back the translation process for the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. Um, they did put out the translation. It is, it is a very excellent translation. Um, if I, I did a five-minute reading test with this and about four or five other translations one day, believe it or not, this, I did not read this the quickest, but I, I didn't go super fast. I tried to read it at a good pace and what was most understandable to me. <clears throat> and this was not as understandable as I thought it would be. This is a optimal equivalence, they call it. They go dynamic when they have to. They try to go word for word more than the NIV. Um scientifically if you look at translation process um they claim that they struck the perfect balance between word for word and dynamic equivalence um i think that this is a sunday school version so to speak of the nasb i've read them both extensively studied with both of them extensively i've preached a sermon out of the csb and it, it it sort of feels like where the NASB 95 is at a 12th grade reading level, it kind of feels like this is like a um, seventh, well, it is at a seventh grade reading level, but it just kind of feels like it's a Sunday school um, version of the NASB. A, a, some of the sentence structure is very similar. It is going to be in more contemporary language um, than the ESV, but it's a it, it is it is a good translation. I, it's not my favorite translation. Um, my, if I had a top five, I would have to say this is probably three or four. For the simple fact that I I think in trying to blend word for word with thought for thought. I, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of think that they didn't. It's one of those things where if you try to please everyone, you please no one. So that's just sort of my thoughts about the CSB. Um, like I say, I think it's a great translation. Um, does does have some use. I don't think it's the best translation. Like I say, I do not have a college degree. Don't have a seminary degree. Um, but... From a ground-up perspective, I have learned a lot about the Bible translation subject over the years. 
Um, next on the translation chart is the New King James. Um, I think that this translation is underrated by many today, and I think it is overrated by some today. Um, yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, I think that this this is actually a very nice Bible. Um, it's from the McLaren series, I think, from Thomas Nelson's website, New King James. It's it is it's very nice. Um, Thomas Nelson puts out some very nice Bibles. Um, this is not genuine leather. It's true. It's um, they're synthetic leather, but New King James. It is. It's not a very. People would say it's oh, it's an update to the King James. King James only is, do have a lot of correct points about that. I wouldn't say it's a it's an update to the King James because the Old Testament is not the same text as the King James. It is the modern critical text. Uh, the New Testament people say, well, it's a TR translation. King James only is to actually have a very good point about this as well. They, they tend to say that it's not a Texas Receptus translation because they say that every page of the New Testament has footnotes that come from the modern critical text. And so they say that technically, if you're going to mix them together, it's not a Textus Receptus translation in the New Testament. And I actually, I think that's a great point. I, I think they actually have a score on that. Um, it is, it is, it still maintains a lot of the beauty of the King James. I kind of disagree with Dan Wallace on that. However, I'm not as educated as Dan Wallace by a long shot. I'm sort of right there and he's way up there with education. Um, his net Bible is not on my list, but for study purposes, yeah, I think it's phenomenal. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, I think that it does maintain a lot of the literary quality of the King James as far as the, the beauty of the translation and the sentence structure. It does keep a lot of the sentence structure of the King James translation. And so if you are coming from King James only background, I do think this is a good choice. Is it better than the King James? I actually think so, and I'll tell you why. One example, when I was growing up, the church I was growing up in, Matthew 24, there was a verse that said uh, where Jesus is talking about the end times, and he says that um, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. Um, and a lot of people, when I say this, will not like what I'm saying. But I do think that is not a correct translation because when you read throughout the Old Testament and you read what the prophets said to Israel when they're judging Israel, that terminology is used extensively that the crows, the vultures, the vultures will be gathered. And it's, a, and it's, and it's saying that the judgment's going to be so severe, there's going to be so much death, the vultures are going to have a buffet. <clears throat> and Jesus repeats that statement. Um, now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm not sure if the King James has that in the Old Testament when the prophets say that. I did not look at that before I did this video, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think that it's important that that is maintained with what Jesus says, because Jesus is using the same terminology um again that repetitive sense of the scriptures and Jesus is using that and so if you translate that differently in the new testament than what it says in the old i don't think that that's a good idea because remember Jesus is building off of all of that <clears throat> so um new king james uh in that verse matthew 24 it does say wherever the carcass is there will the vultures be gathered um, I think it's an excellent translation. Do I think it's the best? Not necessarily, because from a perspective of easy to read in today's 2024, um, 
a lot of dynamic equivalent translators have an excellent point when they talk about most people's reading level being sixth grade or lower. Um, and depending on where you are in this country, I'm not trying to be offensive, um, but I'm just going to say it. Depending on where you are in this country, reading levels could be a whole lot lower than that. They could be third grade or lower. Um, <laughs> it's it's just the way it is. It's very sad that we have to say that in this country. It used to be the complete opposite. Um, so yeah, reading levels are lower. Um, dynamic equivalent translators, modern translators, do have an excellent point with that. Um, I'll sort of give a numerical order to what I think is the best. And I will do that at the end. But the New King James, uh, it is a recommended translation. I think it's a great translation. Next is the ESV. Um, I've already stated that I really enjoyed the ESV and the four Gospels three years ago. Um, I don't know. There's just something about the wording of this. I would almost call it a newer King James, that's not what it's called, is the English Standard Version. Um, but it, the wording of it is excellent. Um, it keeps that traditional uh, dignified, authoritative sound of the King James and the New King James. Um, the wording and the sentence structure, the order of it, resembles the NIV in places. It is not identical with the NIV. It, it's not a dynamic equivalent translation. This is an essentially literal, formal equivalence translation, meaning it's word for word. They try to keep what the authors of each book, let they try to translate it in that style. Um, it does build off the RSV. King James only us do have... They kind of have a point because back in the day, if you know your Bible translation history in America in the last hundred years, the RSV was extremely, um, you either loved it or you hated it. And the wording of it, they say, was great. Um, it's still very close to the ESV in a lot of verses. Um, but there was some liberal, far-left leaning translators on the RSV board back in the 1950s. And uh, you can see that influence still today in the NRSV and the NRSV's updated edition. The NRSV is not in any Bibles right here. I don't recommend it. Um, I think that is there's a lot of great scholarly work in them, um, but I do not recommend them from a Bible-believing perspective. <clears throat> so... Um, the ESV starts with the 1971 RSV text. Crossway bought the rights to that. And they went through. Um, it was done. The, the scholarship, I would say that I know of, the scholarship as far as credible scholarship and scholars who believe the, the Bible is divinely inspired, um, the ESV had translators that would say that the Bible was infallible. Uh, as far as I know, I have not heard any of them say otherwise. I haven't heard someone say otherwise. Um, the ESV was done by people who um, loved the scriptures. They trusted the scriptures. And it is, it, it's excellent. I really, really, really recommend the ESV. New American Standard Bible, NASB. This is the 1995 edition. You can see there's some um, bookmarks in this. I use this Bible a lot. My wife actually uses this Bible in her Bible studies. Um, the NASB 95 is the most accurate word-for-word -word translation out there that is not a interlinear. Um, that's readily available. It is It is readable. <laughs> I don't like how some people say that it's wooden. I feel like some people hear this phrase and everybody picks up on it. The NASB 95 is not a wooden translation. Um, actually, the New Testament uh, Greek translation of it, they say, is the finest out there. 
Um, in the Old Testament, because it is literal word for word, I don't know. I guess maybe there is some wooden parts. That basically just means that it's clunky. It doesn't flow right. And I think that's fair. Um, the NASB 95, it's so literal that it doesn't flow like the King James did. Um, so, but <laughs> if you want to know what God said in modern English, okay, uh, the, the, don't... <laughs> I don't care what they say. The NASB 95 is in modern English. And you could say that it's more understand. I, I personally think it's more understandable than the ESV or the New King James. So it does make my list. It's in my top five list. It's really tough. It's not my first pick. It's not my number one pick. But it is an excellent translation. Everyone should have an NASB 95. If you know anything about John MacArthur, you know he's preached through every verse in the New Testament. And I think that was in the New American Standard Bibles. Um, you will not go wrong with an NASB 95. Um, everyone should have one. So, <laughs> what is my picks through this? I will probably do a part two with all of these videos. Um, or with this video on Bible translation, this is the rough draft of the video. What do I recommend? I, if I had to narrow it down to four, okay, I'm going to go with four. What do I recommend? Number four spot. In order of accuracy, I'm going, to be, I'm going to try to be as fair as I possibly can. My number four spot is the NIV, okay? NIV is a great translation. There are places where it is still very accurate, and it does follow some of the word-for-word -word structure. Like I said, there are a lot of different issues with it. I think I'm going to do a video of every translation and I'm going to give my pros and cons on them. Um, but the NIV is number four. Number three is the NASB 1995. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is excellent. I don't know. It could almost be my number two recommendation. Uh, you can't, you won't go wrong with it. It is extremely trustworthy. Um, outside of the Legacy Standard Bible, this is John MacArthur's uh, number one recommendation. This is his number one translation. Um, wonderful translation. Wonderful translation. My number two spot, New King James. Um, like I say, it has the structure and wording of the King James. It has that literary beauty. I think it is very memorizable. Um, and it, it's just, it is just a great translation. Like I say, I'm going to do a separate videos on all of these translation, uh, translations. Um, but my number two recommendation is the New King James. There are lots of study resources that goes along with this, as well as the NIV. That, that is, that's one plus the NIV gets. Is study resources. So, my number one recommendation for Bibles. <laughs> ESV. The ESV Bible is my number one translation. If I had to pick one translation to do it for the rest of my life, I would have no issues picking the ESV. Um, I think there's a reason why a lot of King James onlyists when they are not King James only anymore, they go to a new King James or they go to an ESV translation. I don't think, um, I, I, I don't think there's any mystery with that. Uh, and the reasons are because it is in the, it is in that line, that lineage of English Bible translation. 
Um, this will have to require a separate video. I do, I want to go ahead and give you a recommendation. This is what it finally put the pendulum on the ESV for me. Um, I want to recommend to you Leland Ryken's book, Understanding English Bible Translation, The Case for an Essentially Literal Approach. Um, now, he, he could come across as controversial. Um, I think he brought a very fair and balanced opinion. If you're King James only I would actually say that he's more your friend and ally than what you realize. Um, he makes no bones about it. The ESV is his number one pick, his go-to, but he is on the literal word-for-word -word side. So if you notice, at my top four translations recommended, my number three, or my number three and up, the top three are all word-for-word -word translations. Number four is the NIV. So uh, I, I'll, I'll end this video on this note. There will be a part two. There's just no way you can cover this whole entire topic in 30 minutes or less. I, there's just no way. Um, but there will be a, a part two to this video. Uh, this may even just become a playlist on my channel on Bible translations. Um, <clears throat> I'll say this for the NIV. It is <laughs> it's a very hotly debated topic. Uh, it's, it, it's People either love it or they hate it. <clears throat> I think the NIV is very useful because it doesn't put a lot of the modern colloquialisms or the the street language, aka the the um, you know some of the modern cruder terminology when it comes to adult things um, that are that are in certain parts of scripture, and it doesn't it doesn't do that. Um, I do, I've listened extensively to the NIV translators. I've listened to Bill Mounts. I've listened to Doug Moo. I've listened to Mark Strauss. Um, there's another, uh, uh, another lady that's on the translation committee. Listen to her talk. I believe that they are all born again Christians. I think they are fine men and women of God. Um, I, I, there's nothing against them uh, personally whatsoever. I think they are wonderful people, and I thank God for the work they've done for the modern Christian church. Um, there are issues that I disagree with with the NIV. Here's the thing. If you don't have a native English-speaking congregation, then you really need to consider the NIV or the NASB 95. Um, Maybe CSB, but again, um, I think you should just go one way or the other. I think you should just go word for word or dynamic. Um, but I would not, I wouldn't recommend anything less than the NIV. Um, I don't know that I would recommend the NLT necessarily for certain children. I think that I, I need to read it a little bit more. The, the new international readers version uh NIRV is great for children it's it's uh it's a very nice translation to even listen to um i think that it's great but large in part uh, and i'll go into this in other videos i think even for children look if they have a, if there's certain parts of the NIV they don't understand you're their parent help them understand it um <laughs> It's not that complicated, people. Um, so, but as far as general use, study, daily reading, devotional reading, I wouldn't go any lower than an NIV, honestly. Um, I, I do think it has a lot of good use. Um, like I say, if your congregation is not native English-speaking people and you've got a lot of immigrants, a lot of people who are still learning English. It's it's very very tough. I think you can still teach them the ESV. Um, 
but you know, and some people may, maybe they just don't read as well. Maybe they have a reading disability. People can't help these things. I, I, I'm trying to be as fair as possible. Word for word approach is my go-to. NIV, I think if, if, if someone's just having a hard time with the others, then I think they should start with the NIV and work their way up. So there you have it. My number one is the ESV. Number two is the New King James. Number three is the NASB 95. Number four is the NIV. So there you have it. Stay tuned for part two. And I will be continuing on this topic for a little while. I'm a bit of a Bible translation nerd. And uh, I think the whole topic needs a little bit of fair and balanced information. And I hope I can contribute that to everyone who uh, is interested in that topic. So God bless you. And uh, I'm going to go here in a little bit and have some time in my Bible. So I encourage you to do the same. God bless you. And as you've heard me say many times on this channel, if you're a man, act like a man. If you're a woman, act like a woman. God bless you.